You're getting old, dude. Yeah, I know. You ready? Cheers, little shot. Shake it off. It's game time. Showtime. It's game time. And ladies and gentlemen, here he is, Dr. Josh Partnow. Thank, thank you. How are you today? Nice <laughs> to see you. We might use that for the intro. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the show. We've got Dr. Josh Partnow here, an ER physician, director, ER, medical director of the ER at California Hospital, That's which right. is downtown. Big place, big busy, uh, high volume, high acuity place. That sounds like high stress. We're going to talk wellness and burnout today. We're in the same group, Valley Emergency Physicians, and a year ago, Josh stood up at our shareholder meeting and told a story about burnout and wellness that, as I told you before, Gary Tampkin and I were leading the discussion, and I was like, Gary, you gotta cut this guy off. He's talking too long, <laughs> he's going too far. This is just, it's not what we're looking for. But Josh, Gary let him talk. Josh really told a good story. And a lot of people came up to me after and said, I really identified with that. That was good to hear a story of, you know, kind of burnout and wellness. And I figured we could start there. And yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Do you, do you remember that story? You know, there's so many uh, patients where the encounter can be similar to that one. I, I don't actually recall the exact specifics of that encounter. But um, just to give you a little bit of background about myself, I um, went to medical school and college back east and um, did residency 2001 to 2004 at a busy, high volume, high acuity trauma center, St. Luke's Roosevelt in Manhattan. And um, then I worked in a- um, I know St. Luke's. Oh, yeah, it's a fun spot. It's yeah. busy, busy in um, Midtown in the Upper, uh, upper West Side of Manhattan. Um, so uh, I was accustomed to seeing a lot of sick people and being very busy in kind of a chaotic New York City mm. trauma center. Mm -hmm. And then I took a job in Jersey City Medical Center and worked another busy high volume place for a few years. And then- um, After wife, residency. After residency, yeah. Okay. And then my wife and I moved out to California and worked in a few emergency rooms that really fell in love with California Hospital. And that's where I found my home. And that's where I'm the current medical director. So you've been a doctor 16-ish years. Since 2001, yeah. yeah. How long have you been at California now? Since 2007, so that'll be uh, 10, 10 years. 10, yeah, going on to my 11th year. And now you're the medical director. Yep. As of October, yeah. I'm sure a whole new set of uh, burnout wellness issues different from being a provider. Yeah. Um, so, how for you, working in these environments, kind of busy, high volume, you know, when you graduated residency, I'm, I'm curious, like looking back, were you burnt out in residency? Did it happen afterwards? How would you? So looking back on it, I didn't recognize the uh, the warning signs of burnout. But looking back on it, I think it occurred in my first job during my first three years out of residency. And I remember a lot of providers that I was working with saying, geez, you're a nice guy, but you're kind of a jerk at work. And <laughs> we don't really enjoy all the negativity that you bring to work. And I, I didn't see it at all. I just thought I was doing a great job and I thought I was pretty happy there. But I kept getting pushback from other people, both nurses, Feedback. And, yeah, nur nurses and providers saying, you're really just not that nice of a guy to work with. You're not nice to us. You're not nice to the patients. You seem angry. It kept the word angry and frustrated kept being brought up. And I, I'm not. I'm a very positive person. I'm well liked by a lot of people. And you, and the funny thing is, you had no idea besides these little. This I just feedback it was them. them. I just thought, you know, this is not the right fit. And um, when uh, my wife and I got married a couple of weeks later, we decided to move out to California and just kind of start afresh and just, you know, the glory land and 70 and sunny and let's just see what happens. Mm -hmm. and I started working at a small emergency room um, on the west side uh, full time and then part time at California Hospital. And um, I brought all those same attributes to those new emergency rooms. And I was getting the same feedback. The Dr. Part now did not, the angry Dr. Part now just moved to the yeah. west coast. So. Um, classic you think you know a new beginning you move to a new place and you're gonna have new uh, outlook and that's not you cannot run away from this absolutely not and I still didn't I didn't know this term burnout and I didn't recognize anything but I certainly didn't feel that happy at work Did, let me ask you this was the environment different 
or was it the similar high volume so ER? So the west, the west side emergency room was teeny. It was a teeny little place in St. John's. It was in the old emergency room, and it was catering to a different clientele, kind of a an upper class, a lot of movie stars, a lot of athletes, um, people with high expectations. So there were different um, stresses placed upon us, but it wasn't like you know move the meat, see patients fast, crank through chart well that was that was did not you the case. think at the time maybe a different environment like that would did you but you didn't really appreciate that there was much of a problem not at all so yeah, you not did it's all. not like you were thinking oh i want to be happier at this kind of a practice you're just you guys were coming west yeah and so i was doing the per diem work at cal and the full-time work at st john's and a nurse came up to me about a year into my living in California and working. I was working a lot of hours just to kind of, you know, run into the rat race as fast as possible. I was doing like 180 hours of work, still flying back and forth to Manhattan and working every six weeks for 20 hours on top of a 180 hour work month. So wow. I was doing upwards of 200 hours a month, some, some months. And I had a nurse, um, come up to me and uh, and we became casually friends and my wife and, and she became friends and one day she came up to me uh, in the emergency room and said you know I don't really want to be friends with you anymore and I said wow that's shocking I, I thought we were totally cool and we wow. hung out socially the three of us and you know had other couples you know hang out um, and she said you're just, you're kind of a nasty person. <laughs> and I was like, I'm like the fun, happy-go-lucky guy. She said, no, nah, no, nah, outside of work you are, but I don't like the way you treat patients in the emergency room, and I don't oh, want to associate with you anymore. Wow. That was a huge gut check. I'm going all the way back to like 2008, 2009. That's when she told you that? Yeah, so and I that's lost when it kind of finally yeah. registered. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Oh, and she really was like, she, I've never this heard, wasn't yeah. like a wake-up call. You changed, and you were still friends. Like, no. I'm now friendly with her, and I've wow. told her that I've come a long way since then. But, yeah, she... Um, she was a great, she's a great person, and she's friends with a lot of the nurses at Cal, still some of the old temper people. She's not, she hadn't been there for years. Um, but she is a nurse locally, fantastic person, fantastic mm -hmm. nurse. And that was a big gut check for me to say, wow, I lost a friend over being a jerk at work. You heard this one. Yeah, oh yeah, that was, that, that hit me deep. That's when I realized it's time to do some introspection. In the meantime, I was, developing problems with coworkers, developing problems with patients, and because of that, developing a problem with the director, Mark Futernick. Mm. He had a problem with me. Everyone had a problem so, with me. So this nurse said something, and then you're starting to hear stuff more. I was and getting then the written up by patients. I was oh. sitting in Mark Futernick's office over and over, and he was coaching me through it, trying to say, look, we really like you, and you're doing a great job here, but you've got a major interpersonal problem going on here, that your professionalism is just awful. And I didn't see it. And then we would have these monthly, rev uh, yearly reviews where you're looking at what people are writing about you. It's like, wow, I can't believe this. And I'd go home and you know, pour my soul out to my parents and my wife saying, do you, do, am I like this? And no one could understand because that's just not, Nobody how, on, in your, not how I function. In your social yeah. life, in your kind of your personal no life. No problems whatsoever. Yeah. yeah, my wife would joke around that, you know, I could be, you know, I'm a little bit of a perfectionist. I can be difficult to deal with a little bit. It was kind of like OCD personality traits, but um, yeah, nothing, uh, they were shocked. And I would, I mean, this is written up. And I was saying, I'm reading this documentation. It's awful. Then about, Two years into. Let me just make sure yeah. this is. We'll cut this out. But let me just make sure this damn thing's on. Yes, that's, that's off. Good. All right, this is perfect. Then, about two years into working at Cal and St. John's, I decided I was going to work more full time. At so when is this? You had been a doctor for. 10 years? No, 2001, 2004, and then we're talking about like 2009, 2010. So yeah, I mean, from residency, six years. Six years, yeah. okay, okay. So I decided I was gonna work uh, full-time at Cal, and in that transition, this is made like August of 2010, roughly 2000, 2009, 2010. Okay. Um, I had a really big problem with a colleague, with a, with a physician. Another doctor. Major problem. Um, I decided, that I was going to one-up him and try to uh, relocate a dislocated patella while he was struggling with it. I just kind of walked up and was the cowboy. I was like, oh, I can get this in two seconds, and he's struggling with it. Didn't ask permission, didn't introduce myself to the patient. I did nothing. I just, with a brashness, walked up and 
cowboy on cowboy it. And, and, and immediately everyone was looking at me saying, what in the world are you doing right now? Did you and do it? Did I get it back in? I mean, the negative reaction was so fierce and so fast, I, I backed away. It was the, the entire interaction was less than 20 seconds. So you didn't do it, but just you, you approaching. Oh, I, I definitely attempted to relocate her dislocated patella with, with wow. him and the patient and the mom right there. It was just, I don't know what happened, what came over me. I just decided that I was going to try and be the cowboy and, and put this whole drama to rest because they were talking about doing conscious sedation and all these things. I said, this is no reason, this is simple. I mean, I, I put <laughs> patellas back in, in two seconds. That, so the, uh, the whole thing stopped. Again, on, this is actually looked at on a security feed. We had to look at, it was a pretty major deal. Wow. 20 seconds. He came over to me, big guy, emergency room doctor, and I was typing, and I felt like, boy, that was not a good interaction, but whatever happened is done. He came up to me, hot and bothered, yeah. tight in the throat, and leaned over and said, if you ever do anything like that ever again, I'm going to blank kill you. Wow. And he was pissed. And then he quit. Oh. He stopped working there. Oh, because of that interaction uh, with you? Because of other interactions with a lot of, he, he also was kind of a difficult person to deal with <laughs> and had his own burnout issues. But um, So that was a huge gut check. I then landed myself back in Dr. Fudernick's office, uh, roughly around that time, because there's other things going on with me. I was, just, I was a disruptive physician. This is like you go into the principal's office oh, over yeah. and over. And um, I'd been written <laughs> up by uh, admitting docs, I'd been written up by nurses, I'd been written up now by these other colleagues of mine. I didn't realize you had such a history. We might have to cancel <laughs> this interview right now. So then I sit down, <laughs> so we had a lot of talks, uh, Dr. Fudernick and I did, um, in the little break room. Then we had an office visit in his office. It escalates. He sat down, I sat down, and he said, Josh, I think you know what the problem is here. And I said, I do. And he said, and we had a long talk that day. And he said, I want to be crystal clear with you. If you sit in that chair again in my office, that's going to be your last day of work. Do you understand what I'm talking about? And so I he, said, crystal clear. So I have a finally, major problem. No. I then went home and I did some major, major soul searching. And then every month, what I did with, with Mark is I said, let's schedule a sit down and you tell me how I'm doing and I'm gonna work on this. I promise you, I'm gonna make this work. I love this hospital, I love this patient population, I love my colleagues and the nurses. This is a knee problem. This is not a problem and it's got nothing to do with my environment. This is a problem with me. Mm. So um, I then did major soul searching. Still didn't let know me, the term burnout. But, but let me stop you before you get into the soul searching. So. Was it the threat of losing your job? You liked California? It is, I'm curious because you had had all these other things that kind of built up to this. this why was, culmination. was Yeah, why was it then that you were finally like, okay, I'm, I'm ready to deal well, with it? This was a couple years of problem and now to have a termination over my head because of me and my disruptiveness and my unprofessionalism had nothing to do with medical care. I was providing excellent medical care. I was so wound up at work and so stressed out without even realizing it and so angry and bitter at yeah. the whole thing and being that, that disruptive classic patient that, uh, yeah. that gets described, uh, provider rather, that gets described, I realized that boy, if this person that I respect that has been given me chance after chance after chance is saying, this is it, we're going to fire you if you don't clean up your act now, this is it, last chance, that's when you have to do some soul searching and say, I've got a problem. It's kind of like you, you finally realize, you say, someone has to finally realize, boy, I keep falling down drunk and knocking my teeth out. Eventually you have to say, I have a drinking problem. So it's like you didn't finally- I don't have a drinking problem, I don't drink. Though. You didn't finally admit to yourself until That's you were it. about to be fired for this. You're like, oh wow, it's yeah. me. So what we did is we had these sit-downs. Again, this is years before the term burnout was even a sexy term, the wellness, physician mm -hmm. wellness, this is years and years before that. Um, I then tried to chip away. And so what I did is I created this little mnemonic that people would tease me about, but they knew I was working on it. Everyone in the ER knew I was working on it. I actually had to like stand up and tell people what I was doing, that I was actively engaging in self-reflection, mindfulness, wow. and self-awareness, and trying to improve myself. And I put a little mnemonic above the, above the computer screen, and I looked at it a thousand times a day. I said it to myself every time I walked into the emergency room. I put it in my locker. And it was K C H R. Okay. Kindness, compassion, humility, and respect. 
And was I perfect? No, absolutely not. And I, and I definitely had foul ups, and I still do. I mean, you don't, you can't get away from this thing. You can mm -hmm. only manage it. Mm -hmm. And I had foul ups a couple times, but minor ones. And I would be, we would have chats in the break room with Mark, and he would just tell me how I'm doing. And and every year it was getting a little bit better, and fewer people were writing awful things about me in my <laughs> yearly reviews. And you know, I was getting better and more liked. And luckily, it was a new group of nurses, new group of doctors. So I had in all honesty, a second chance to prove myself as a human being in that emergency room. A little bit of a fresh start. Yeah. Um, <coughs> so then uh, KCHR, well, eventually we got new How computers. How did you come up with that? Um, I just thought about like, what is really, what is my role and goal here in this emergency room? And what is dragging me down? And I, I reflected on what Teresa Tatani had said to me, this, this nurse from a couple years before this. Yeah. And, um, I just put it together and decided that was going to be it. Years later, we got new computers, and that, that's no longer up there. But that people will still kind of joke around and say, hey, that KCHR is still working for you, isn't it? <laughs> um, so then fast so forward. So that kind of mantra. Yeah. Of, of constantly saying to myself, every day I went into work, every day that I was in the shift looking at a visual cue and in my locker at the beginning of work saying, be a good guy. Relax and be a good guy. That, that's that's all you got to do. I'm wondering, like, for people that have similar issues, you know, kind of figuring out something that gets them into that space of who they want to be, and then a visual cue. Yeah, of some the sort. cue. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you like write the thing down like you did, have a bracelet, you know, some kind of thing, and some then, kind of practice that yeah. gets that trains you. And then when you talk about changing hats, like when you get home to put the, the doctor hat off and put the dad or the husband hat on or just the Josh hat on. Mm -hmm. When I was going into work, I was, I was getting into that zone of just like, let's just find some peacefulness. Let's get to work and just do a good job and be happy. Mm -hmm. And walking into that emergency room, every single time I said to myself, just calm yourself down, relax, enjoy yourself, provide the excellent care that you know how to provide and, and don't, don't tick anyone off. So you kind of had a ritual, a ritual you kind of yeah. set your intention in the beginning, you know, certain positive self-talk, you kind of got into a state beforehand and then yeah. executed when you were there. So then now fast forward. So now that's, that's the whole background. Uh, now I'm as well liked as I think anyone else is, uh, have nice things written about me by nurses and, um, and um, patients. Um, I have gone from being a pit doc to the associate medical director in February and then a couple months later got promoted to be the medical director. It's kind of a great story, right? Like burnout problem doc about fired however seven years ago or whatever yeah, and man. now you're the medical director. It's kind of a good story, right? Because you can probably identify this now yeah, in yeah. other up and coming physicians and kind of counsel them and say, look. I was that guy. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. Um, so, uh, in, so then we went to the shareholder meeting. Um, was that two two years ago, or was that last year? In I San think Fran? it was last. No, yeah. it was last year because we've only been talking about wellness and yes, burnout this was for last, a year. Last uh, last winter, we had Dyke Drummond come and lecture us and. And again, so I had been coming to the shareholder meetings, but I wasn't great about being there on Sunday. Dyke was the Sunday thing. Yeah, your talk was on Saturday. Interesting. You got up and talked on Saturday because Gary and I had a little space on Saturday where we guided everybody through these some of these questions. Interesting. Oh, wait a minute, or maybe that was in no, San that Diego. was in March. Hey, hey, that was in Huntington. That Beach. was in April. That was in Huntington. That's Beach, right. Your yeah. thing no, was I, in April. The I Dyke learned, thing was I, in December. Yeah, That's I right. learned from from Dyke a ton. Um, so, so. Um, Again, Sunday wasn't, a, I wasn't great at participating and getting, you know, staying in town for that because of Most wife and kids. Most people split, yeah. yeah. But, but for, you know, I'd heard about this lecture coming up and I thought it was kind of hokey, but it, you know, maybe related to me a little bit. So I went in there and there was, you know, of the 200 people that go to the shareholder meeting, there was 60, 70 people there at that time. It was actually a good turnout for a Sunday. Yeah, it was pretty decent. So um, I was listening and <laughs> I was either laughing or crying the whole time. It just, it was, he was describing me. Yeah. He, he was totally describing me mm -hmm. to a T. Mm -hmm. Every single thing he said got a hit to the point where I was texting my wife going, you gotta come down here. This guy is describing me. <laughs> and she was managing the kids, she wasn't able to join. But I just, I mean, I left there with eyes wide open. 
I was even more so than your oh, yeah. process with Fruternick. This now it's psych really now put it's words a, on it and identify yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so then let me plug that for a minute. So that the vi the shareholder thing or the talk that he gave, it's actually available on the VEP website internally. Um, it's not public stuff because it's dikes, but um, you can access that through the portal, I believe. But anyway, you can get to it and, and to hear the stuff that you're talking about, it's available to VEP providers. So, so I then went on and I said, I, I got to buy this book, read the book. Well, he, they actually VEP provided us the books. And we still do provide the yeah. book. If you haven't got one and you want it, show the let's let's show. Highly the recommend this book. I'm, and I'm not even I'm not much of an avid reader, but um, so stop physician burnout, and it's actually an interesting title because it's not necessarily stop physician burnout. It's recognize physician burnout. If you can't prevent it already, recognize it, treat it, manage it, cope with it. Yeah, understand. Because it's that. not a problem with a solution is a dilemma. Yeah. And that's a big, big difference. So I read the book, I'm not gonna lie to you, I read half of it, I didn't read the whole thing. But in the <laughs> first half of it, again, it was reinforcing things. I took notes and then I took that to my provider meeting. And my provider meeting was May 10th of 2017 and I just gave a synopsis of it. And here's the beautiful aspect of it. During the past six months preceding into that May, I recognized that there was a physician in our group that was struggling. Mm -hmm. He was struggling in a way that was so similar to mine and it was just unspoken. It was the elephant in the room. This physician was doing many things that I had been doing, short with staff, short with patients, disruptive, um, not yelling, but certainly sarcastic, spiteful, digging, um, mm -hmm. um, a look on his face that was not a kind look, short, cutting people off, the whole thing. Um, and I'll, I was not good at helping, I was not good at it. And I spoke since then to, to Mark and, and Patrick Shanovich, our, our AD, and I <coughs> thought in retrospect, we as a group were failing this provider. We were letting it slide and bringing up problems with him, but not really addressing the problem. So, uh, or the dilemma, so to speak. So in May, I gave this uh, quick, you know, 10 minute bullet point uh, lecture to my providers, and he came up to me and said, boy, you, all, the same way that when Dyke, who's a professional, I'm just an amateur at this, same way when he was speaking, that I heard and felt his message, this provider heard and felt my message. And then he had one big <coughs> problem after that with a nurse. Mm -hmm. And the thing blew up and we had to get involved administratively with him. And he said, I'm gonna start working on this. I have a problem. And not only is, am I recognizing it, I feel like it's okay that I have this problem. Yeah, A lot of us do. And I said, that's so important. And I met with him a few times and I, I you know, recommended the book to him and he did read a bit of it as well and did soul searching. And between what he does in the emergency room and what he does out of the emergency room has been allowing him to cope and to be happier at work. And he told me that I've saved his career. And that was wow. the most meaningful thing I've ever had Good for you. And he has been practicing the same time as me. He practiced in New York. He was um, providing excellent patient care in um, overseas, actually, for about a decade. And then <coughs> came to California Hospital a couple years ago to start working with us. And now, again, just like me, just like a lot of us, we still have that ability to be a problem, but we're recognizing it, softening it, and determining, A, how can we prevent the disruptiveness? Mm -hmm. And if it's developing into the disruptiveness, how to pull it back and how to disengage mm -hmm. and how to provide ourselves with methods of relaxation during the shift, minute to minute, second to second, hour to hour, shift by shift, month to month, year to year, that we can allow ourselves to be happy. You, you're bringing up a lot of things we need to unpack here. Let me ask you, what kind of things helped him go from kind of this angry burnout state to better? Like what practically did he do? So there's a lot of things. Um, number one, he's, he's an avid athletic person. And um, he and I both suffer with, for some chronic back pain. 
and he was able to um, get some therapy for the back, some physical therapy, um, and get back into the athletics. And he's a surfer. So get physically active and surf. That's one thing. He's in extremely good shape. Okay. Number one. Number two, he uh, was able to incorporate increased sleeping, increasing, uh, improving sleep hygiene. Very important. Um, the so next funny thing, how basic some of this stuff yeah. is, but it really <laughs> makes a difference. Yeah, huge. Like sleep. Sleep, yeah. Um, and then relationships outside of the emergency room with his wife and kids, just yeah. increasing time and energy and opening your heart up to, um, you know, oftentimes emergency room doctors, we're, we're closed off. We can't allow anyone to come too far in because if there's a bad outcome, it affects us too much. Yeah. So opening you have a little bit up. of a professional kind of wall there yeah. to, to protect you day to day. Absolutely. Um, and then, so relationships, you said um, physically active, the relationships, what was the second one? Sleep. Sleep, okay. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's out of the hospital. And then he and I sat down and we said, um, I think it's time to cut the shifts down a little bit. You're doing a lot of shifts. Work less. A lot of shifts. 15 to 17 a month. It's a little bit, it, I mean, you're, this gets into a little bit of a controversy within the organization because there's not enough physicians, you know, we yeah. constantly have schedule issues. I'm the hero, I'm the workhorse, put me to work, I'm gonna do it. He's the guy that never gave me a whole lot of re um, request, request restrictions <coughs> on the schedule, because I'm the scheduler. Mm -hmm. So he gave me carte blanche, mm -hmm. just put me on, put me on 15 times, I need to earn a living, I'm used to making more money somewhere else. Now oh, Dyke speaks to that. It's a the, recipe. The the money situation comes into play, yeah, right? Got to work more, got to make more, live in expensive yeah, city. Yeah, and I think it's kind of a lifestyle thing too. You know, you're hooked. Not a, it's kind of like the high rider life. There's more adrenaline to that. You're making yeah. more money, and you're spending probably spending it. Yeah. So um, he, he's not uh, anyone that was spending too much money, but he was accustomed to making a lot more money, maybe even twice as much oh, wow. overseas with very little cost. Overseas, you made more money overseas far overseas. I don't want to get into the specifics of where he was working just because it would um, compromise his, his um, yeah. anonymity because it's very specific. But um, um, That's interesting. Anyway, I didn't mean to interrupt. So, uh, <clears throat> so then what did he do while in the hospital? Yeah. Number one, I say he, he was working less. Two, I decided to do a little experiment. We have two parts of our emergency room. We have the acute side this will be interesting. And then we have the fast track side, which we call ED South. <laughs> okay. Yeah, you make a little less money over in ED South, but it's just flat out easier work. It's mm -hmm. less stressful. No one's dying It's a little there. mindless. It's, uh, the, you've got three nurses dedicated to you. You have the same uh, system with the computer and the dragon and everything. Yeah. You have a dedicated MA dedicated tech to set up all your pelvics, to do lack setups. Sounds like the good life. Do your splinting, all this stuff. They are dedicated to you. It's quiet. The patients aren't yelling at you. In general, it smells good over there. It's quiet. You're not constantly signing EKGs. There's less data coming at you and less stress. Yeah. So I said, why don't we, A, cut down some shifts a little bit, and B, a couple of times a month work over there. Just a little, shake it up a little bit. Right? Do more of that. Do more of that kind of this good life Yeah, just fast a little track. bit. Here, one or two. So, so if he's doing 15 to 17, let's cut it down to 13 or 14 and let's do two over there. Now okay. all of a sudden, you're doing 12 hard shifts instead of 17 and you're doing two fun ones. So he wasn't doing any fast track before. I, most, of us, most of us don't. I, I do occasionally work over there because I just find it fun and, and maybe it was my own, you know, coping mechanism as well. Yeah. Um, so he loves it. He's so working wait a minute, So what else did you change? So you changed that, and then what else in the ER? So um, some things that he does that I have also that I also do is we um, we escape to the break room. We're currently undergoing a revamping of the break room, which is very important. I think it's extremely important important for provider morales to have a little teeny break room, something where you can escape to with a couch, a chair, a computer quietness so some grapefruit a little you know granola bar something, and yeah. fridge something to escape. just get escape the noise and everything so what i do and what he does is multiple times a shift multiple i'm talking like every two hours 
almost every, every one hour? two hours. Yeah. Okay. We escape back there. And you I'm guys talking, work? Are you guys working? You guys, you're just, yeah, you're always in this work. Always in not, not like the MLK guys, but, but we, I'm just we, giving we you trouble. So, um, so we escape back there, and I collect my thoughts. So I have a little cheat sheet on things I have to do to catch up with my work. So I have a, a, a piece of paper that has the name of the patient, the room, if I saw them, if I wrote a note, if I finished the note, and a little area in there with what's pending. And I check the boxes. So I review that. I have a little snack. I have water. I sit down. Do a little stretch. Sometimes I lay down for a minute. This entire break that I'm de describing to you, Two to four minutes. Oh, really? At tops. Short, tops. short, and kind of high, high yield. And sometimes I go onto the couch. I just breathe it out. Just kind of. I just zen it out. And I'm not, I'm not a meditation guy, but I just take some deep breaths. And I just let it out. Just kind of lower that blood pressure. Yeah, the whole thing. I eat a Get out of the adrenaline snack. a little bit. And then I go back and I feel awesome. I go back and I, I hit the patient rack. I feel good. Mm -hmm. And I walk, I walk back in there with a zest, a joie de vie. I feel good, I feel reset. And then here's the other amazing thing. Not only am I reset, but when I pick up those next two or three patients, some of them are easy to take care of because the diagnosis is, e is easy and they're just easy going. Some is in the middle and some is <coughs> difficult either because the diagnosis is difficult or it's a diagnosis I'm a little bit more um, confused by just in general like the eye or the dizzy person or the patient might just be a little bit more demanding or verbally mm -hmm. abusive whatever sure. it is a I bring more energy to that situation yeah I've got more of a buffer a brake pad and then I reward myself I see three people go back to the break room why not <laughs> I reward myself I got a little orange I have two tangerines I have an apple I got a banana I've got two granola bars I got a cliff bar I've got a PB and J I've got whatever we made for dinner the night before I've got mm -hmm. and I have it in my head I know what I'm going back there for. So I go back, I'm like, you know what? I'm gonna manage like this, type snack. the note up. Yeah. I'm gonna bang the note out quick. I'm gonna go back and have a quick snack, an apple. Apple takes me 45 seconds. I used to do that in the milieu. Yeah. I don't eat there anymore. So Everyone you separate those. Number one, it doesn't look good. Yeah. Number two, I separate church from state. I go yeah. back there, I eat my apple, I clear my head, I think about things as far as uh, organize my thoughts and I've rewarded myself. And you guys, and, and you're doing this in a very busy, very busy. ER, right? Very this isn't busy. just, oh, there's nobody to see, and yeah. like there's always people in the waiting room, but still, you found a way to kind of take these breaks, whether it's just a breather mm -hmm. or a little snack or some food, still seeing a lot of patients and be pretty And effective. do you know who I got that from? Not from uh, Dyke Drummond, I got that from smokers. Smokers do smoke break. All the time. <laughs> Modeling after smokers. smoke break. They, they somehow do all their work. All the nurses jump out there and they do the cigarette. I, I don't smoke. I used to kid around with them. I wish I smoked. I could go out there and hang out and relax. Well, obviously smoking is awful for you for multiple reasons. <laughs> and it jacks up your blood pressure. There you go, drunk, doctor. Yeah. So that's my smoke break. It's my healthy break. It's now, do you Zen schedule break. these, or do you like you just kind of? In my head, I know I can feel it's it. It's just planned in yeah. there, so you don't like wait to hit a tipping point and then go, nope. oh, "Man, I got to get out there." You're just like it's just part of the routine. It's just yeah. built in. Now, here's another thing: when there is that big moment, right? It happens a couple times a year. That big moment, the, the everything's coming down. You got something critical going on. You got a lot of sick people, and you've got some patient who is just in your ear about something, being verbally abusive and you have a nurse coming at you about something else and maybe related to that. It's all getting... This sounds like up. the you overwhelming oh, moment. Yeah. You can feel it, right? Time out. I just say, you know what? One second. Give Unless me, something's just, critical, just give me you a just minute. need one minute. You're coming at me. I can only do one thing at a time. You all know that. I'm not Superman. I want to dedicate the time and energy that it takes for each individual one of these things. Number one, let's have security chaperone this patient over to a safe area where I, I can talk to him safely, where it's not so heated. Yeah. Number one. Number two, I'm going to sign that EKG, make sure there's no STEMI, and then time out on the EKGs just for a minute. With the nurse, one at a time. So there's three nurses. Who's got the most important thing? Time out. And when I do that time yeah. out, I take a little breath. Right? We're all human beings. I'm no different than anyone else. Right. I'm just a human being. You push me and squeeze me tight enough, I'm going to bust just like anyone else. So, so you know, time out. And then sometimes when it's really the big moment, I step outside. That's, yeah. that's everyone's cue. I'm stepping outside, yeah. not even to the break room. I'm going outdoors. 
I need to calm down for a second. So, so you still have the same oh, stimuli yeah. that you, kind of... It's not going away. Uh, ...that you could potentially react Absolutely. to that, that triggers, really. And now you manage those with your kind of calm communication, a little time out, or stepping out. And I do it respectfully. There's no disrespect. I'm not putting a hand in anyone's face. I just say, you know what? <laughs> You guys got me. It's just, this is this is a little bit overwhelming. Just one second. I'm gonna I'm gonna manage everything. You know me. You all know me. I've been here for a long time. I can medically manage every single thing you're talking about and multitask it. Give me a second here. This is a little bit overwhelming. That that what you described and I, and there. I describe with it to them. Everybody coming at you like usually there's a time or two a shift where that happens to me too. The PA comes. They got something. And they want to talk about it now. now. There's a new ambulance right there. The admitting doctor's on the phone. Like. You can't do everything, and they all seem to be these like intense, pressing things. Yeah. And that's where like some of my reaction is just, you wait, you, you know, like kind of a little jerky, yeah, yeah, like a little probably. Jerky, yeah. So yeah. I could learn yeah. from you and be like, hang on, just a second, let me come find you when I get a second because I want to talk about this. You know, like what's the most pressing thing I got to deal with now, and then kind of kindly so communicate do, through and that. I, and I have learned, you don't raise your voice. You're not doing anything passive aggressive. You're not doing anything condescending. Yeah. You're just saying to someone, you're giving them the cue, all of you guys, <laughs> just back off just for one second. Right, because it's we're only one person. Yeah. You can only do one thing at a time and now now when was the last time the guy at the front driving the 747, 35,000 feet up in the air, has every single person in the back asking him for peanuts and water? and bathroom break. It just doesn't happen. That guy's in his own space, protected with a bulletproof. You can't no even one's get talking to that to guy him. anymore. No one's talking to him. When yeah. he wants a break, he comes out, they push the little cart in the middle, and he socializes with the, uh, with the um, airline the attendants. attendants. Yeah. And then he goes back. Yeah. No one's jibber-jabbering to him. He's got the headset, he's got his cues, but he's, he's, in, he's in the zone. Yeah. That's, we don't have that. No. We don't have that benefit. No, we're highly accessible. I'm thinking of a lot of the stay the doctor stations are right out in there. Oh yeah, for it's a fishbowl. So um, now, after that, I have the big crescendo of my wellness. Here's the big <coughs> crescendo. Yeah, what do you mean the big crescendo? Here's the um, the biggest help for me. Okay. Right. I've done all that stuff. This sounds good. You're really just Done serving all. this up. One, one last thing before I get to the, to, to the big one. Um, the phone, right? Always picking up the phone. Well, Dyke taught me, you pick up the phone, do a little squeegee breath. He calls it squeegee breath. Just take it, just a, you know, you got to pick up that phone a thousand times. Everything's talking to you and ringing and the unit coordinator's talking to you. Every time I pick up the phone, hi, it's Dr. Part now. How can I help you? Every single time. Take that, that pause one to just... One quick second pause. Yeah. So, the big one. I've done the shift, I've done everything, I've managed it perfectly. <coughs> Do I still have pent up angst, aggression, uh, um, frustration, anger, whatever it is? Do I have it internally? Yeah, absolutely. Who doesn't? Who doesn't walk out of a busy emergency room where they have participated in patient care and don't leave with a little bit of whatever that is internally. Well, yeah. What do I do? <laughs> I get into the car, I listen to some nice music, I drive a nice car because I decided I was going to treat myself. It's my little portable office. Mm -hmm. I then go not home. I do not go home from work. Oh, okay. Where do I go? You go to the gym? I go to the gym. Oh, after? At the gym. Every time? Every. Well, I mean, if I work 2 to 11, I've worked out before, so I've already drained all of that kind of baggage, so to speak, before going to work. But, but in general, let's say I work from 5 to noon, I get off at 12.40, I get to the gym by 1.10, 1.15, mm -hmm. I have a little ritual. I go to the uh, massage mat, I lay down, after I get my workout clothes on, I lay down, take a 15 minute nap. At Shut down. At, at the, the gym? gym? Lights out. <laughs> Lights out. <laughs> You're the homeless guy <laughs> sleeping on the I'm gym floor. I'm talking about it. <laughs> no, 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 it's raised up. <laughs> And the massage mats up high. You're still sleeping at the gym. I'm sleeping at the gym. That's ridiculous. I am re-energizing my body because okay. I have so I'm not, much. I'm not waking you up. I have from so your nap. much. In, it's 15 minutes. I don't even have to set an alarm. It is. It wakes me up at 15 minutes. 
15 minute power nap. I learned that from my grandfather. I mean, my, 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 my father-in-law rather. Yeah. Uh, my grandfather also took power naps, but my father-in-law is 77, still working. He takes a 15 minute nap at 2 p.m. every, every day. So, um, so I take my 15 minute power nap and then I just absolutely annihilate the gym. I mean, every single piece of myself is left on the mat. I, I mean, to the point where I can barely breathe. You let it out. Uh, everything. Every, then, and, and you I'll, like CrossFit? CrossFit, uh, I would not say, uh, my wife does more of the CrossFit. I'm doing the HIT class at the CrossFit gym, so it's called Cardio Flex. Okay. It's, uh, it's every day of the week, but the ones that I do um, but tend to be. But this is the exercise you're doing? That's the exercise I'm doing. So I, I will take that to Equinox and do that at my Equinox gym okay. and just recreate it in my head. But I'm going all, all the way to the wall. And I'll tell my wife as I'm driving home, honey, I can't. I can't come home right now. It's not. It's not going to be good. Right. I just have too much so to, to deal with the to out. deal with the family stress. You have the little kids running around and the noise. And this is one of the biggest. Is this the big thing? For me, this is the big thing. So this is one of the biggest ways you cope with this because this is still here. I think oh, that's yeah, your point. It's not going this away. stuff doesn't go away. You don't have this like you know this like Zen thing where things no. just pass through you and they still don't kind of it takes trigger a lot, you to react. It takes me a lot longer to get to that pent up spot. But um, so, th so, so I work out hardcore and then I come home and I'm ready for it. Mm -hmm. I, I'm ready for anything that, that the house brings to me. Mm -hmm. uh, new bills just arrived. The um, doorbell doesn't work. Uh, we just got $3,000 more of expenses coming now up our way. I got, the, yeah. I got the kids project due. I got the kids yelling and fighting. What's for dinner? The whole thing. I can manage any of that stuff. I yeah. feel great with it with your workout. Have you done little experiments where without the workout, you're just oh, yeah. like so, this bottled? So here's the catch. <clears throat> I've had a frustrating day. I leave late. I don't have time now to go to the gym. Mm -hmm. Got to balance it. It's either gym or dinner with the kids. Well, dinner with the kids is going to be... That's more important yeah. to Now, you. I will find help somebody to go pick up my kids from the school or Project A, B, uh, uh, some kind of after school thing. I will throw money at the problem, have a helper delegate delegate help. What does your wife do? She's uh, a, a merchandiser for a decan wine. So she works She's full time, working yeah. full time. So we split up the chores, but we decided have a college kid for 25 bucks, pick up the kids, take some pressure off of us. You work out, I work out. So you still get the workout. Now, if I leave too late from work and it's the shift where I'm fighting traffic and I'm, and I'm fighting to get home on time where I really only had 70, 80 minutes to get to the gym and get through the gym and matriculate myself home. Then I come home and I'm, and I'm pent up. And I have a shorter fuse. If the kids are misbehaving or totally. whatever it is, it pressures the life. Yeah, I mean, um, it's definitely, I, I'm not a yeller, but I'm aggravated with the kids. I'm less able to, uh, to woosah it and deal with it. Less resilient. Yeah. Tolerant. Then my number one goal is I need me time tomorrow. Tomorrow's mm -hmm. me time. Mm -hmm. So whatever's happening. What do you do for me time? The, the gym is the me time for me, yeah. So I decide tonight is, you know, some people turn to alcohol and drugs and all this stuff. For me, at most, it's a, it's a third of a glass of wine on a day like that. Yeah. But in general, it's, get, it's eat healthy, get to bed on time, avoid the bad snacks because I didn't do anything at the gym to to start burning off the calorie. So don't go to the ice cream, don't go to whatever that thing is that you think is gonna make you feel good. Get a good night's sleep, eat healthy, get a good night's sleep, shut the whole thing down, get the kids matriculated to the bed, all that stuff. Get a good night's sleep. The next day, I'm prepped for the, the shift, the gym, the gym, the Gets shift, you back. or just the, Gets or you hike, I hike a lot, you know. Yeah. Um, hiking is a huge, uh, huge wellness for me. Uh, and then one final thing that I do, um, which really has helped me out a ton recently is I downloaded an app on the phone. I'm not a, a tech savvy guy. I'm not really into apps. We're not social media people. I downloaded an app on the phone called Headspace mm -hmm. and it's a meditation app. Yep. And I started I've doing done it. Very popular. And it's amazing. And I, I haven't even. Now you said you're not a meditator, but this might, I think that might make you one yeah, a little bit. Not, not a meditator. A beginner. But this, this is a. Boy, listening to him just feels good. And I, 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 <laughs> Andy, I can't even make it through. Andy the, from Headspace. I can't even make it through the three-minute one. And now, when so. you're ready, <laughs> take a couple deep breaths. 
and then let your <laughs> let your mind wander away from your body and back. So those are like those are my tricks. You know, you, you have to have healthy relationships outside of the hospital. You have to have um, to to have some kind of physical wellness. Not everyone's an avid workout person. Not everyone yeah. has a great diet. Uh, it would help. I think that in the emergency room setting, it really helps to you know practice what you preach and to avoid salt, avoid cholesterol. Yeah, I mean, diet, I would sleep, say you know. that eating healthy and some sort of movement, I would recommend that for everybody. Yeah. Figure out something you like that you can do that will work. And then whatever that thing is that gets you to that space that you need to get to, you mm -hmm. have to find it as long mm -hmm. as it's healthy. For me, um, it's it's a lot of hiking. I love watching football on TV, so I get geared up and I, and I make sure that, you know, with my schedule, I dedicate, whether it's because I'm going to record the game or I'm going to hit it live, I make sure that I can watch the Philadelphia Eagles play on Sunday or Monday or Thursday, depending on what Pretty it is. Pretty good team this year. Yeah, they are quite what good. What happened to that quarterback? Yeah, he blew out what his ACL. What do you do about that quarterback? Foles isn't terrible, but... In 2013, he did the job, but he's... Can he take you to the... All the way to the dance? I don't think so. You know who my team is? We beat you this year. Chiefs. We're yeah. terrible now, though. Yeah, they're not good now. They can't They can't uh, solve the riddle. So, yeah, those are, those are my tricks of the trade. Um, I find that um, eating healthy, avoiding excessive alcohol, sleeping well, having you know wonderful personal relationships, doing these tricks of the trade that I have in the hospital, decreasing my workload. I mean, I, I have more work to do administratively, but that's because so, that was my that was my passion. But I <coughs> decreased the workload in the emergency room. I, I was going to ask you about that. So now that you're you've moved from being an assistant or associate director to the medical director. Has this changed, or the, what are the new challenges to your wellness now that you're not in the? Is it easier? How's it? I find it actually easier. My job satisfaction has skyrocketed since becoming the AD and now the director. Why is that? I love managing people. I love macroscopically taking care of patients. So you know, you're, you're the system. Mm -hmm. If the system and the operational aspects of the emergency room are set up and the ancillary is set up to help provide excellent care, it's less stressful for everyone, including myself. Working on the coal mine. And it's really, really rewarding professionally. And the way that uh, Mark has described it is you do a shift of 10 hours, you see 20 patients, 20, 25 patients. Mm -hmm. If you're the director, you're, you're intervening on 80,000 patients a year. Mm. It's unbelievable wow. feeling. So it's, there's also responsibility and stress that goes along with that. So the other day we couldn't find the Tono pen. There was no Guayac developer. These, well, these things add up to the frustration of the provider yeah. and that doesn't make me feel good. So that's yeah. frustrating for me. Um, and I, I attack the problem fast. If something's put onto my plate, I attack it immediately. Let's come up with a solution. Let's figure out what to do to make everyone's stay in that emergency room better and um, decluttering. So it sounds like in kind of shifting roles, doing less ER work and kind of now as the director, it's been less stressful and in some ways a little more fulfilling. And rewarding, yeah. Rewarding, it, it was yeah. my passion. I love, I love helping people, uh, professionals, I really do. It makes me feel really good. Um, and in doing that, I was a 15 to 17 shift guy a month and right now I'm doing six to eight. Yeah. And, or six to ten and that is a lot for a director yeah. um, but I feel and I have delegate I de do a lot of delegating so there's a lot of things that Mark used to do himself doing four shifts a month that worked perfectly for him and he's I mean literally the iconic director I decided yeah, a, a you're not going there to fill his shoes it's impossible you can't take that stress on number one number two delegate Delegate, delegate, delegate if it works for you. And that's during the shift. That's during the shift, and that's also. You're fine, the sun's hitting me. That's during the shift, and that's also within the role. So if someone get, comes at me with a problem with STEMI, I ask Luke Palmasano to deal with it. If it's trauma, I, act, I ask Luke, he's our other associate medical director. If it's something with a disaster prep, I ask Wendy because she does disaster prep. <coughs> it is um, Delegation. a difficult shift to fill. I lean on the entire group and say, group, please help. We have a difficult shift to fill. Before that, I was just going and doing it myself. Yeah. Um, and then with uh, you know Patrick Shanovich, I have him help me out on a ton of things. Mm -hmm. And um, if I go to a meeting where there is a lot of homework for me, I delegate it. 
And I think that's, that that's be. you know, if it works for you, it's a beautiful way to decrease stress. And then I have little checklists. So uh, Mark set me up with a lot of information and I spent eight hours one day and said, let me dissect this information and create Excel spreadsheets. And now I take it out of my mind. It doesn't have to be in my mind. It's right there in an Excel spreadsheet. Same thing with my little cheat sheet at work. Yeah. I don't, and, and when someone hands me a laboratory work or EKG or ex, whatever it is, or, or I'm speaking to someone, boom, get it into the computer, get it out of the mind of the computer. And all these little tricks of the trade help decrease stress. Um, but you still have to recognize uh, you're a stressed out person, you're a stress ridden person, you have physician burnout, and you're working in a very busy demanding ER. You can't change any of that. All yeah. you can do is find coping mechanisms to deal with it. It's kind of like you have to equate it to a diabetic taking their meds, a hypertensive patient, or an alcoholic. It's a chronic that, problem. Yeah, you're not getting away from it. You can't have a sip of the alcohol. The problem is, it. you can tell an alcoholic, don't hang out with your alcoholic friends. Mm -hmm. With a physician burnout, you're still going to the emergency room and hanging out mm -hmm. and working. You, there's no way around that. Mm -hmm. um, but have, you know, decreasing it and finding these other ways is definitely helpful. One thing I think that's um, cool about you now as a director that you going through your burnout process, kind of emerging on the other side, now that you're a director, that's a tremendous asset. Yeah. That you know that and you know how people feel and you know how to fix it kind of intimately on the inside only makes you a better director, you know? And getting back to that provider that was having the struggles, he asked me, can I meet with you once a month? We'll just do touch base. Kind of mentoring along like that. Yeah. That's cool. We have another provider that I don't know necessarily, I wouldn't quantify him as being a burn, burned out physician, but he has the disruptive pattern as well. And it's due to stress because he doesn't have any of these problems outside of the emergency room. It's just when you squeeze him tight, he reacts negatively. How do you cope with that? And so I was, um, I had to intervene with that because I got a, a physician that complained about him and um, which, which will happen when you're the director, you receive these unpleasant emails and I addressed it with him and I had a friendly talk with him and I offered him some of these you know suggestions on how to manage that. Let me ask you a couple questions about the book. Go ahead and flash that book again. What were some of the things, what were some kind of the more salient things you took from that book? Helpful things for you. Recognition that this is, it's okay. You have it, it's okay. A, you have it. Like there's nothing B, wrong with okay. you. There is, yeah. yeah. It's not a defect. It's common. Just, it's common. Uh, talk about it. It's cool, man. Talk about it. And then these these mechanisms on how to how to <coughs> how to help yourself. Yeah. And then you have to just keep reflecting. This is not going away. You got to keep hitting it all the time and find new ways. Would you? Would you? If somebody, if um, a college kid came to you and said they were interested in medicine, would you recommend for or against? I tell people the same thing every time. <laughs> if you love it, and it's the thing, it's your thing, it's what you want to do, and you want to do it your whole life, and you know what you're getting into, do it. If you don't love it, do not do it. You mm. have to love medicine. I talk about medicine all the time. Not because I'm burned out, I talk about it because I love it. I love medicine. When, mm -hmm. when uh, we were just hanging out socially, and, um, and someone brought up and said, Is it, it's only physicians that sit here and you know, in gatherings and talk about medicine. It's because I, if someone said, who are you? I would say, I'm Josh Partner, I'm a doctor. Mm -hmm. I'm a husband, I'm a dad. Yeah. I'm an athlete and I'm, and I'm Jewish. I'm a, I'm a US citizen, I'm American. But if someone said, who are you? I'm a doctor. When I leave the hospital, I'm a doctor. I feel like a doctor. When I go to the gym and someone gets hurt, boom, I'm jumping on them. Yeah. If, uh, if I hear an ambulance and it's right near me, I'm looking to see if I can help. If I'm on an airplane, I've started IVs on airplanes. Have you done some I've, of the airplane oh, calls? Yeah, I do it all. I, because, <laughs> because at the end of the day, we are highly trained clinicians and uh, we have been given a skill set that most people don't have. Mm -hmm. And I feel that it is my responsibility not to be Superman, but to be aware Do what you can. and mindful of anything around me. So I, um, I saved a kid's life who was choking years ago to the Heimlich maneuver. Oh, no Felt kidding. Like, you know, it was something I would just have done. Yeah. I've, I've uh, people at the gym that have been trapped under the weight. I've, I'm the one that is gonna jump and get the weight off. So there's, I'm just constantly um, thinking about ways in which I could apply myself and that doesn't 
stress me out at all. I actually find it relaxing. And when, <laughs> when I'm sleeping on the airplane at 35,000 feet and someone says, is there a doctor on board? It just goes up. And then I, one day I had one flight, I had three patients or three people I was taking care of at the same time. <laughs> and I said to the airline attendant, I said, not to be a You sound the butt, like a black cloud. I, said, I was like, um, I'm not running a clinic up here. <laughs> it's not the Mile High Clinic. So, you know, <coughs> it's cool. We can fly all the way across country, but you know, maybe a t-shirt or something. <laughs> yeah. Like, oh, would you like one of those little alcoholic beverages? I'm like, nah, I'm not gonna start drinking in the yeah, air. Yeah, you can get I mean. some gold wings. <laughs> My wife, uh, she was like, how about some lunch for the kids? And so we got some lunch. I got, actually, I got a free flight from Southwest. I flew up and I took care of, just from here, from Burbank up to San Jose for a football game. And there was a guy having a problem. And yeah. he, had, he had a little bandage. He had just been AMA'd after having a calf. 30 year old guy who was uh, looking bad in the AMA air. AMA 30 after, oh, after a calf, yeah. So I just, I like to get involved. Um, Wow. But uh, so yeah, that's my that's my take. I've actually not opened up publicly about what we spoke about before, uh, so I haven't gone there with that whole about the burnout stuff. No, I'm talking about the specifics that we talked about today with the knee and, and people still know about the knee. Some of them, the older time people, but mm -hmm. um, the knee and this, no one knows about the Phoenix office conversation now. Now a bunch of people do, but you're okay with that? Yeah. Kidding? Out. Yeah. It's, look, it's a little embarrassing, but. You just have to own it and say it's not embarrassing. It's who I am. It's who I was, and it's what I work on. Um, and and I am a success story, in the sense that I have risen up in the profession, both at the hospital level and at the company level with VEP. Um, and I hope to impart some help to others that will either a prevent going through what I went through, or while going through what I went through to kind of nip it in the bud, yeah. recognize it to avoid being that disruptive physician and ending up with a termination. Yeah. So. Um, Let me ask you a couple of, uh, other questions and then we'll kind of wrap up. Um, what would you tell, because sometimes medical students watch this stuff. What, what, would, what would you tell, you, you remember med school? It's a long time ago. It was a long time ago. And I was not happy in my med school. Do you have any advice for medical students on how to do well and survive in medical school? I mean, you have to balance your time and you have to make me time. You can't just study and pour everything out the whole time. So my buddies and I decided that um, going to class was not for us. So we uh, studied during the day at home together. Yeah. And then we played basketball with the janitors every day. Every day? Yeah. And then we went to the gym and we were, we were again, going. this is like this athletic stuff, theme yeah. for you of balance and doing a lot of socializing, you know, making, making, uh, you know, uh, relationships, which was, uh, very meaningful and supportive. Um, and then you have to pick the type of medicine that you want to do. Yeah. You can't just say, I'm going to be the surgeon. Dad says I'm the surgeon guy. You go into surgery, you are living in the hospital. I mean, there's just no two ways about it. And if that's something that is your passion, I tell students, surgery or no surgery? Okay, here's the scenario. It's 3 p.m., you've worked for eight hours. Do you want to go to the gym, hike, hang out with your girlfriend, grab a drink, watch the football game, or go upstairs to the operating room for the next six hours? Me, <laughs> it's easy. I want to go to the gym, I want to hang out with my family, and I go watch the Eagles game. I don't want to go to the OR for six hours. So some people do. You speak to the surgeons that are truly happy and they're excited. They want to go back to that OR. Mm. That's not, I thought I was the orthopedic life. surgeon guy my whole life. I was the guy that was going to do that. And then I got there and um, this is a, a moment. It, my med school uh, roommate watched this to be awesome. So we were the gunners in the class, you know, top of the class. We um, signed up for the ortho. Where did you go to school? Uh, UMDNJ, New Jersey Med School. Um, and I went to Cornell undergrad in Ithaca, New York, and there's the Ivy League and the green and everything at UMDNJ. It's, it's a decent med school, but it's not top notch. And then it's all concrete in Newark. And it's mm. very, um, uh, it was kind of sh uh, shell shocking to us. But so there I am with my roommate. He's a triathlete guy. Now he's a radiologist, just an awesome dude. We're there to get in line for the sub eye, for the ortho sub eye, because we're orthopedic surgeons all the way, all the way through. Whole what lives. year are you? You're in medical school, you're third like year. third year? Okay. First month. So okay. there we are, and um, beautiful morning, uh, sacrificed working out that day, and um, there's, there's, there's two other people, you know, standing in line, or I'm talking early, real early. So we, we were 
we were uh, accepted into the sub I along with these other two people. For your third year sub third I. Year. Okay. First Monday. All right. So there we are, Ortho. So, uh, so we get the thing and we show up for the first day and it was a hip. Uh, it was a, a, a um, Total femur river. fracture. Okay. Yeah. So we get in there, we're all gowned up and we literally look like uh, going, it was that movie, um, <laughs> is it Outbreak? Where they put that whole suit on with the monkey yeah. virus. Yeah. So we got the whole thing on and we're, I mean, you can just barely see one another. <laughs> And M Matt is to my left, and this Chris guy, who's now a successful orthopedist, he looks at us, his eyes are this big, and he goes, I've waited for this my whole life. <laughs> and I look over at Matt, and it's early in the morning, and the last thing in the world I want to do is keep this lead vest on for the next 12 hours, and I look <laughs> at him, I go, it's done. This, this is not us, man. Uh, oh, you did that moment, you were like, done. not me. And, he and wanted it, you didn't. Yeah, I, fe I felt it. I mean, so uh -huh. I looked at Matt and I said, and I, uh, so we did our <laughs> thing and then we actually, um, we played hooky for most of that month. Oh, no kidding, you just skipped And out. I love ortho. I actually, it's one of my favorite things to do in the ER. And, and one last thing, that's another thing that, that Dyke Drummond said, find the, the patient encounter that makes you feel good and find yeah. the procedure or the disease process that you like to take care of that gives you, now obviously you can't cherry pick, but if there's a shoulder and I've had a rough day, I'll say to the other attending that I'm working with, hey man, I've had a brutal day. There's a guy with dislocated shoulder. I love shoulders. Can I just go and do that one? And yeah. they'll say, yeah, sure, do it. Um, when a patient satisfaction situation is ever like, Do doctor, thank you so much. That made me feel so good. You you helped me and I don't have my, my gallbladder pain anymore or whatever it is. You saved my kid's life. Take that and really internalize it. You yeah. might even write it down in a diary. I'm not a diary person, but I, I bank it. I put yeah. it in my memory bank. And, and he talks about the positive energy bank. Um, Anyway, so as far as med students, kind of storing don't in the force good. yourself to go and do something you don't want to do. It's so important. And if medicine's not your thing, get out. Find something else. And, and with an MD degree, there's a lot of successful things you can do. You can do public health. Um, you, know, you can do concierge medicine. I actually do a concierge medicine gig that really um, makes me feel good in Hawaii uh, that I do once a year. Um, so it's just, you know, you got to find your niche and um, some people like clinical informatics, mm -hmm. the wellness is out there, kind of so the there's just so many options. Any, we'll kind of wrap up with this, any advice for residents, young doctors going through the residency process? So there, you know, they've already selected the field of medicine that they're going into. Um, I would say time management, avoid the um, excessive alcohol that is so rampant throughout residencies, avoid the stimulants. There is a lot of stimulant abuse in our, um, in our residencies, a yeah. ton of it. It's cocaine, it's meth, it's yeah. molly, it's all these stimulants. You have to avoid that stuff. It's so unhealthy. And um, look, obviously, residency is an extension of college and people are gonna get crazy and have some drinks and go out and <coughs> fool around with this person and that person. That's just part of life, but you gotta be cautious and and know that you are you know you are at the very beginning stages of creating professional relationships that will go through your entire career. Mm -hmm. um, time manage, sleep, avoiding bad bad, sleep. bad stuff, and you know get your athletics and make sure that you're you know um, that you're not having excessive weight gain throughout residency. Kind of starting some of these habits that carry yeah. them on later can kind of stop burnout from even starting. And even look, things like this, like this is very, uh, very cathartic for me and this is part of my wellness, even uh, yeah. meeting with no, you this and was, talking about this. This is a great interview. Yeah, so. Thanks for doing it. Anything else you want to tell everybody? Yeah, I think within VEP, if there's anyone that wants to reach out to me, um, <coughs> partnojo at yahoo.com, um, I also have um, uh, a VEP uh, email. Partno Joe. Yeah, so P A R T N O J O at yahoo.com. Okay. okay. Um, very accessible. Um, I love uh, hearing from people and helping people out. And um, if there's anything that I can do to um, kind of help you find your way, I'm, I'm here. And, and, I, and I love the fact that on, every time I interview new candidates coming out of residency, I'll say, or, or really new candidates, no matter where they're coming from, I'll say we have wellness champions both at our site who is Renee Grevin Garcia, mm -hmm. and then within the company mm -hmm. with you and, and with Gary. Mm -hmm. And that is so meaningful and so useful that, yeah, look, you can go somewhere else to make 15 bucks an extra an hour, right? If, that, if that's what you're interested in, that's on you. If you want to come take care of a, of a very uh, needy patient population that needs our help, we are the, we are the, 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 the safety net, 
And if that, if you're going to pour your heart out of that, and that's going to make you feel good. And if you believe in the um, in the um, in the VEP model, which is to perform excellent medical care, you know, throughout the country, um, and you know, you want to be in a place where you're feeling well supported, um, you know, this is the place. Mm -hmm. This is the company. And I'm right happy on. that you and Gary are doing this. This is really meaningful. This is a great. I mean, this was a great interview. I, I'm hopeful that um, you know we can get it out there and people can can learn from it and get yeah. better. And those who maybe aren't even aware that they are burnout, like I've been through, and you certainly have, yeah. can help some people. Yeah, I really can. All right, thank you everyone for your time. Thanks, buddy. Yeah, thank you. That's good. That felt really good to me. That was awesome. Cause good stuff.